Welcome to. <laughs> welcome to. Really? Is this what <laughs> <laughs> Here. <laughs> oh, this is, all right. Great. Thank you guys for all coming to Biodiversity Conference 2013. This is the final talk in our series for this weekend. Um, this has been brought to you by HSU Society for Conservation Biology. Our final speaker here is finishing up her master's work at Humboldt here, studying Hapropoda miserabilis. Wow, did I say that right? Mm -hmm, Great. Uh, the dune silver bee, a really a beautiful and fun species, and she's going to share with us some of her work. Kim McFarland. Okay, thank you. I'm going to plug myself in here. So does that make me like the keynote speaker or something, if I'm like the last oh, one right summing yeah. up the whole conference? Yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, so what about the lights? Can we dim these or yeah, turn those down a little bit? So, yep, as you said, I'm Kim McFarland, um, also known as the Bee Lady. I've been studying the silver bee, Hyperpoda miserabilis, for about five years now. And um, people like my committee, one of which is here, are anxiously waiting the uh, completion of my thesis. So am I. Um, anyway, so today what I'm going to talk about is my birds and the bee story of a bee, a local dune bee, Hapropoda miserabilis. And so why should we care about a local bee? Well, this conference is about biodiversity, and one of the things, um, in order to preserve biodiversity, you have to know the basic details about the natural history or the life history of an organism before you can even start to understand how it fits into a greater ecosystem. And we all hear how bees are these really important pollinators for food crops and other things. And um, so we need to know a little bit more about the bees. How do we preserve the bees in order to preserve their pollinating services? So we're going to talk a little bit about who the bee is and how it makes its living and why we should care about it. So first of all, um, bees nest, uh, most bees nest underground. Most bees are solitary. I'll talk about that a little bit more. But the silver bee nests here in our local dunes on the Humboldt Bay um, in the sand. They make a tunnel underground, and they nest in dense aggregations. So instead of scattered evenly over the landscape, each individual female makes one nest but next to her neighbors. I, I compare it to like a condominium complex or an apartment building. Um, so they're, they're aggregated together, but each female has her own nest. There's no hive, there's no queen, there are no workers. So underneath that nest, um, the way she builds it is she makes a natal cell, and the natal cell is a, made out of a deposit that she excretes from her dufer's gland, which is at the base of her abdomen or the back end of the bee. And she makes a depression down underneath this ground and spreads this secretion around and makes a little capsule or like a barrel shape. And really all that's holding that barrel shape together is the surrounding sand, because it's very thin. So they nest uh, underground. And then um, they're probably starting to nest. Usually we see them above ground about May or so is when people start saying, I've seen this swarm of flies at the bees. What's that? Or at the beach, what's that? And it's not flies or usually the silver bee they're talking about. So the males emerge first. They come out of the ground, out of the nest underground, in sometimes as early as February, usually more like um, March or April. And then the females emerge second. And the females emerge around April or May. And upon emergence, the first thing that happens when a female emerges is that she gets totally uh, pummeled by male bees. When the males emerge, what they're first doing is they're searching for a female to mate. That's really the only job of a male bee is to find a mate. So this is what we call a mating ball. All these males, and you can tell the males because they have the white faces, are swarming around the female, trying to be the first to mate with her. And when they form that tight clump, we call that a mating ball. And if you take Michael Mesler's pollination biology class, he'll take you out in the spring to the dunes, and you'll get to see these mating balls. And whenever you see one, you're supposed to scream, mating ball, so everybody can come and watch. So the males, as I said, have white faces. The females have hairy gray faces. They're also larger than the males. And they also have hairy scopy or hairy legs on their, the back hind leg. And those scopal hairs have multiple uses. One is when they're digging their nest, they use it to push the sand away from the entrance of the nest. And also, they <coughs> use it to trap pollen grains as they're foraging for flowers, uh, flowers for pollen. So they, the grains get caught, and they pack it in those little scopal hairs and take it back to the nest. 
So that's what we know about the silver bee's life history. And what I wanted to start asking questions about the things that we don't know about them. So first of all, um, my initial question was, how do these males find females? You've got this huge expanse of the dunes. They're nesting only here and there throughout the whole North Spit. And these males are flying around looking for females. How do they find them? Well, they could be doing it visually. That's one thing. But when I started watching the searching behavior of the males, this is what I found. Uh, these are males. They both have uh, white faces. The yellow is probably pollen that's gotten kind of on their faces. They're foraging. They fly extremely close to the ground, only about 2 to 10 centimeters, depending on the ambient wind speed. They fly very quickly. In fact, they fly so close to the ground and so quickly that I've actually seen uh, male bees kind of crash and burn as they hit a pebble or a piece of uh, shell that's on the ground. Oh, I have a little video. Let's see if this works to give you an idea of what the searching. Oh, come on. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, let's see. Da, da, da. No, it's not going to do it, I don't think. Nope, sorry. Video didn't work. Anyway, what you would have seen <laughs> is male bees flying close to the surface. You would have heard their buzzing sound, seen how fast they fly. And you also would have seen how when males are approaching, um, in this case, a mating ball, uh, they are approaching um, from a downwind direction. So the wind was blowing this way. I think the next slide shows that. Yeah, there we go. So the wind was blowing in this direction towards the upper right part of the screen, and the bees were flying more towards me. So they're flying upwind. They're flying very close to the ground. And when they fly, they do this really interesting pattern where if they're far away from whatever the source of the scent is, they fly in these big, wide, sweeping, horizontal, back and forth movements. As they get closer to a source that they're aiming towards, this narrows, and so they kind of zigzag in. And this is explained in the literature. It's very common for male insects that are looking for female insects to follow what they call a scent plume. And so the male bee is uh, detecting scent with its antenna. I'm going to back up just a little bit so we can see here. You can see as the male bees are uh, approaching the mating ball, they're bending their antenna forward. So that's how they smell. That's like the bee nose. So they're bending their antenna forward as they're approaching. And you can even see to the, oh, let's go back, to the side, there are two males that are touching antenna. And that's kind of another way that they investigate each other. They're kind of sniffing. Um, I found that if males have been involved in a mating ball, another male will smell that male and see where he's been. So because of this behavior, the flight behavior, I was thinking that it really looks like they're following a scent plume and not so much a visual cue. So I did several experiments. And since um, this is a short talk, I'm only going to talk about one. And that's where I wanted to try to take away the visual cue and just leave a scent cue. So uh, you might notice that this is a tea ball, uh, something you make tea with. And I put the female bee inside the tea ball, the mesh ball had never been used before for anything, um, tea or bees. And if there's just one layer of mesh, the male bee could still see the female bee, and the air would flow through the mesh. And so I'm assuming he can still smell her. If I put a smaller tea ball inside a larger tea ball with the two layers of mesh, the female uh, became, the, her shape became really obscured. And it was difficult to tell that there was a female bee in there. So that was how I tried to do trial tests between a bee he could see, a bee he can't see. And I timed how long it took for males to find the female. So as I said, bees are solitary. Um, they dig in the ground. So after they're mated, this is one female bee. And this is how she makes her nest. To dig, she uses her mandibles, the mouth parts, as a pickaxe. And she breaks apart the sand. Now, you don't think that sand is very hard, especially here. But if you go down to some areas where the sand has been blown for a long time, so it's beaten down to a small sand grain size, it's been compacted, it's had um, crystallized minerals that have kind of cemented it together, sand can become really, really hard. In fact, so hard that you can like bang on it and you can't break it. But these mandibles are so strong that she uses it as a pickaxe to break through the crust layer of sand. And then she pushes the sand with her mandibles underneath her. She supports herself with her middle legs as her front legs continue to push the sand back. And then she takes her hind legs 
in that middle picture, you can see it. And she's taking the sand and swishing it to the outside with those brushes that are her scopey. And it's really beautiful to watch. Um, and she goes back and forth and back and forth, taking more and more sand. And then it leaves this little furrow behind her. So once she has dunk, dug this tunnel, and that tunnel could be anywhere between eight inches and a couple of feet deep. So she's digging a hole all the way down into the sand. And my hypothesis is, and I have to figure out a way to test this, is that she's looking for a specific moisture content and um, sand grain texture when she's digging. And if she finds it right away, then that's where she makes her nest. If she doesn't find it right away, she keeps digging down. So once she gets to whatever depth, you know, strikes her fancy, then she starts to make that nail cell. And as I said, it looks like a little barrel. It's made of the Dufer's gland secretion that she's smeared on the inside of the depression she's made with her body. And on the right, you can see that secretion has turned into a light gray coating. On the left is a nest cell that I've excavated and brushed the excess sand off of. And you can see that it's literally one sand grain thick with the little Dufer's gland glue holding it together. And you can see the light through it. So after she's made the nest cell, then she provisions it with pollen and nectar. The pollen, of course, is a protein source, and the nectar is the carbohydrate or the energy source. And she forms it into this beautiful little island with a moat around the outside. And then she lays an egg in an arc between the middle of the island and the side of the cell so that the egg is not in the moat, which has this liquidy nectar in it. It's suspended above it like a little bridge. Soon that egg, within a couple days, hatches, turns into a larvae, and it starts to eat the pollen and nectar that's been, been provided for it by the female. Now, before she, right after she lays the egg, she seals it. And you can see a cap on the cell that's down in the center bottom. She seals it with a thick cap that's made out of a combination of Dufer's gland secretion and sand. So she makes this like gruel in, in a spiral. She makes this cap. So she never tends to that bee again. And so unlike honeybees, which always have to constantly feed their larva, she puts everything it needs in its little capsule, closes it, and goes away. So the egg hatches, turns into a feeding larvae. The larvae eats all the provisions. And then that will turn into a pupal stage, which is very short for a uh, silver bee. Some bees stay in a pupal stage for several months. But the silver bee only stays in a pupal stage for a couple of weeks. And then it turns into an adult. But by now, it's only about August. So it stays as an adult underground until it emerges again in April or May. So it spends most of its life, most of its adult life even, underground, which is pretty important. So the second part of my study, once I had been watching boys chase girls around, uh, then all the boys die. After they're done mating, by May, Pretty much no by June. By June, they're all gone. They've all died. Females continue to live on through about through June till about the beginning of July, and they continue to nest. So I had no boys to look at, so I had to do something. So I started looking at the nesting biology. And to do that, I had to dig down to where the nest was. So as I said, some of these nests are eight inches down to a couple of feet deep. And what I found uh, were I was following these tunnels. And if you can imagine digging in the sand, <laughs> that sand collapses as you dig into it until you reach it where it's nice and moist. And to, in order to keep a tunnel from collapsing as I'm digging it and to be able to follow the trail, I blow in line construction chalk. I use a syringe that I get from the vet and shoot it into the hole so that fills the tunnel so that once I dig the sand away, I have this, uh, basically this core of chalk. And you can see that the Originally, the, let's see if I can use a pointer here, kind of. No, oh yeah, there we go. So up at the top, at first the nest goes in at an angle, and then it goes straight down. And then as it reaches towards the bottom, it starts to angle off on the side and make this little, little jog off to the side. And originally, um, the people who were studying this bee back in the 60s, and up until I started doing my research, it was always believed that Every tunnel ended in one cell, and you can see a bisected cell in the base. There's a little bit of pollen down there by the number one, the question mark. And then the female would abandon that nest after she finished one cell. She'd go on, she'd find another place to make a nest. She'd dig a whole new tunnel that's like three feet deep, build a new cell, provision it, close it, and then abandon that and go off until she died. 
I thought that was really inefficient. And if anything about natural selection, it's, it's towards efficiency in, pro in uh, creating. So that didn't make sense. So what I found when I did my excavation by using this chalk method, um, also using different colors of chalk to trace different trails and using these skewers to map the direction of the orientation of how the cells are angled underground. What I discovered is that there's not only one cell, but there's usually five that are in a ring, kind of like a wagon wheel. Sometimes more than five, sometimes less if the nest got disturbed beforehand. So what I think she's doing is she's digging her tunnel down. She digs that little side spurt, makes her cell, and then instead of abandoning the nest and going and starting all over again, she just at the base of the downward tunnel starts digging in a different direction. Well, if you think about it, do you want to carry a little bit of sand all the way back up three feet to the surface or maybe just shove it where you were just recently because you got an empty tunnel there? So what she does is moves the sand from the new tunnel off into the old side tunnel. And she does this as she goes around in the circle making her five cells or however many she's going to make. So this backfilling behavior had never been shown before um, for, for this species. And the way that I started thinking she's doing this behavior is I kept bees in captivity. So I went out in February before they had emerged. I dug some up because they were full adults. They were just waiting for the spring to come. And I put them in tanks with flowers and some honey water. And I just watched their behavior to see what they did. And I think that's so important. And what I noticed is that these bees the females would dig into the sand conveniently right next to the glass and they'd get so far and then they'd change direction and they'd dig a little bit further and they'd backfill to where they had been. I was like, wow, so they can do this backfilling behavior. So um, I'm not the only one studying the Habropoda genus. There's a woman who's a PhD candidate down at UC Davis, um, Leslie Saul Gershens, and she studies a system down in the Kelso Dune area of the Mojave Desert. Um, where she's studying the interaction, the parasitic relationship between a beetle that parasitizes a bee. And the bee is also in the genus Habropoda, um, but its name is Pallida, not Miserabilis. And what she found is that uh, this beetle, we commonly call it a blister beetle, um, is an obligate parasite on bees. So it does not do any provisioning of food for its own young. So the, the, the life stage that parasitizes the bee is actually the larval stage. And that clump to the right is about a thousand of these little two millimeter large larvae clustered together in a ball. So what she will do is um, when she uh, lays her eggs, she lays them in literally masses of a thousand. And then all these bees emerge together, or all these um, beetle larvae emerge together, cluster together, and what they do is really interesting. In order to attract a bee, because somehow they have to get into that bee nest to eat the provisions that the baby bee is supposed to be eating, they have to get there. And they're only like two millimeters long. And if they're exposed to the sun for much, you know, a couple of hours, they will just desiccate on the sand. So they group together and they need a transporter. So they are emitting a chemical that mimics the chemical that a female bee would emit to attract in male bees. So there's a male bee coming in saying, hey, you know, I think I'm smelling a female bee. It approaches the cluster of beetle larvae. And instead of finding a female bee, what happens is all these little beetle larvae jump within a fraction of a tenth of a second onto the body of the male. And it, <laughs> uh, Leslie described it to me, they make a body to body chain. So it's like this string of beetles that within a tenth of a second like transfers, you know, literally tens of them over to the male bee. The male bee uh, then, of course, still wants to mate, so it's going to find a mating ball and transfer it to other male bees and then finally to the female. Um, so Leslie started doing chemical analysis to see if she could identify what the, whatever chemical the female bee might be emitting and also if there was something similar in the chemistry to what the beetle larvae were emitting. And she did find that there were certain chemicals that were similar in the, uh, the um, signatures of both of these animals. Not identical, but very similar. So we started to think, well, if there's this cool system happening down in Kelso Dunes, how about up here? We've got a related bee. Do we have that other beetle? So she actually contacted me and said, do you have that beetle there? I'm like, I've never heard about anything that cool up here in Humboldt. That's got to be a desert thing. Um, 
But I started looking around, and I looked through, as I'm going through all of my old photographs for my research, I found what normally looks like a Habropoda miserabla larva, and then I found this thing that didn't look quite the same. I mean, you notice it has pinchers on the front? What would a silver bee need pinchers for when it's just, you know, vegetarian eating nectar and pollen? And it has these little foot buds. And I looked at it, I'm like, that looks like a beetle larva. So I contacted Leslie, and sure enough, that was a, the first documented case of a blister beetle larva inside a Habropoda miserabilis nest cell. But we didn't know what species of beetle it was because I only had the larva. Um, we could tell it was that in that genus, but the DNA analysis, the, the, um, the tissue was too degraded, so she, we couldn't do it. So she came up here, and we looked around, and we found lots of beetle tracks. So the female has an extremely enlarged abdomen on the beetle, which she, drag, on, uh, which she drags on the ground, so it makes this furrow, and then the little seek-shaped uh, feet marks. So we went around looking for the beetle. We found lots of tracks, but no beetle. But finally, in January, I found this female at Lamford Dunes and sent it down to Leslie, and she identified it to species. So we do indeed have a member of the uh, Malloy beetle that parasitizes our Habropoda, so that's pretty exciting. So since my talk was supposed to be really short, <laughs> um, I am cutting it short. And so I have a couple of takeaway messages for today. And first of all, I just want everyone to know that bee does not equal honeybee. Um, when anyone finds out that I'm studying bees, they, oh, what do you know about this colony collapse disorder? I'm like, nothing. I don't study honeybees. I study solitary bees. So there are many, many other bees in the world. In fact, at Lamphere Dunes, Dave Gordon um, documented 42 species of bees, only one of which is, or is um, Apis mellifera, which is the honeybee down the corner. And a lot, it's funny enough, a lot of people don't know what a honeybee looks like. Um, so a honeybee has corbicula, which is a, a curved out area on their hind legs. So instead of hairy legs, like the Habropoda miserablis has, they have like these big scoops, and they pack in moist pollen. And so they carry these pollen baskets. Um, same with bombus, bumblebees. You'll see them do that too. And they're usually an orangish color. Sometimes they're blackish or yellowish and have that banded abdomen that's long and hairless. And that's a honeybee. So the other thing I want you to take away from this is that most bees are solitary. There is no hive. It's every female for herself. She's digging her own nest, making her own cell, providing it herself, closing it off, and that's it. She doesn't tend them anymore. A large majority of bees nest in the ground. Other places where bees can nest is in the hollow stems of branches, um, other cavities. They might make a nest out of gathering up uh, either mud or clay. Some bees even make nests out of plant material. And also that a, bee is not, a bee's life is not just a couple of weeks it spends up above the ground when we can see it. That's only for the uh, purpose of, well, reproduction for the bee. I mean, for us, we think it's for pollination, but um, I'm rather bee-centric, so I think flowers exist to support bees rather than bees there to support flowers. Um, so the little time that they're up above the ground is not the main part of a bee's life. The main part of a bee's life is underground. So it's really important that we not only know where nest sites are um, and know how they nest, but to know what to do to protect them. So if our bees are nesting in the dunes, what kind of restoration methods should we be using to, for one, reintroduce the, the flowers that support the bee, but also at the same time not disturbing the nest sites as we do that restoration work. Also, um, I wanted to highlight some of the other people that are doing research into the natural history of bees or the life history of bees. Um, it's very hard to get funding to study just basic natural history studies. You have to be doing something fancy with genetics or something like that. But just the basic questions of where do they nest, how do they make a living, that kind of thing, we don't know. But we need to know in order to preserve these species. Carrie Lopez is a current graduate student here at Humboldt State, and she's studying the diversity of, horse, of the bees at Horse and Grouse Mountain. Um, so she's going up there collecting bees. She's going to make a fauna of the bees that are there, and she's also going to make a professionally curated collection, which can be shared with other museums and other research institutes, and also do a key so that if you go up, up to Horse Mountain, you can figure out what bees are there as well. What's really cool about her research is she found this bee. She found two female workers, Bombus occidentalis, 
and this bee was thought to be extirpated from our area. They couldn't find it for a very long time. And what they believe happens, um, happened to this bee is that bumblebees are also raised commercially for pollination, just like honeybees are. And the reason they use bumblebees is because they do make colonies. They make annual colonies. They only last one season, but they do make a colony. So you can pick it up and you can move it. So they picked up colonies from the United States and they moved them over to England to pollinate tomatoes because, curiously enough, honeybees can't pollinate tomatoes. There's, there's special structures saying, you know, that prevents them from doing that. So these bumblebees are great at pollinating tomatoes. So we shipped them all over to England. They shipped them back and they shipped them back probably when they contracted a fungal disease, which then spread to other bees here. And there's a couple of different uh, populations of this bee. The ones in the Rocky Mountains weren't affected. Uh, the ones in Southern California weren't affected, Central California. But the ones up here where we live in the, the Northwest, including um, Oregon and Washington State, were affected. And so they couldn't find this bee anywhere. Um, so Carrie found this bee up at Horse Mountain, so very exciting. And just recently, they found one in Plumas National Forest and Lashson National Forest. This uh, site where Carrie's working is Six Rivers National Forest. They also found one in Seattle. And one was seen in McKinleyville, um, right behind Ray's by the, the, by the uh, uh, but it wasn't documented. There were, um, it was with Michael Messler's pollination biology class with all these students with their iPhones and nobody took a picture. So, <laughs> so next year we will find it. Another student that's doing work into the life history of bees is Corey, and he's working on the nesting behavior of Megachylae wheeleri, which is a bee that you can find nesting in the dunes, um, probably just finished up. It's late in the summer into early fall. And they make their nests out of the cut leaf pieces from a plant, Solidago spatulata. And you can see here there's two pieces cut out of one that's a little more round and one that's kind of oblong, and they use those pieces to construct their natal cell that they then provision with pollen and nectar, lay the egg and close it up and are done with it. Um, what he's looking into are the chemical properties of those leaves to see if there might be some kind of potential uh, fungicide or something that will keep um, parasites away. Look, why are they using particularly that plant? They seem to have a definite preference for that plant. Rachel Olaf is studying the silver bee and she's picked up from um, one of my pilot studies trying to figure out the emergence timing of silver bees. We have this spit, the north spit of Humboldt Bay, and I said, you know, bees emerge sometime between February, April, you know, May. So what happens is you'll have aggregations that are right next to each other. One will emerge one week, and then three weeks later, the other nest site emerges. Why? So we don't know. Um, they be, everything looks the same, the same sand, you know, same aspects, you know, but we don't know. So she's been going out and measuring the temperature at depth of each of these sites and finding some very interesting things. She's also trying to correlate that to the blooming period of beach pea, which is one of the major food sources of the silver bee in this area. So phenology studies are very important right now, especially when we're facing climate change, because we're seeing a disjunct between flowers and their pollinators. So with that, um, thank you for coming inside in this absolutely gorgeous day to sit here in the dark and listen to me talk about bees. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. No questions? <laughs> yeah? Scopey, yeah? Mm -hmm. No, in fact, probably what happens when any bee emerges, male or female, they first eat a little pollen because it's protein and they need that to finish their development. Females especially need the protein to develop their eggs. So they'll, they'll eat some <coughs> pollen themselves before they start nesting. And then after that, boys don't need pollen. So they only feed on nectar. So they have, they have a little bit of hair on the legs, but not much. They're kind of skinny little scrawny legs. And so we will watch them if they're foraging on flowers that have a lot of pollen, they actually groom it off. And you'll see them meticulously combing off their antenna and combing off their back and combing off their sides. And they finally get it to their legs, but then they rub their little feet together and all falls off in a little pile. So they actually wash the pollen off their bodies. They're very meticulous. And you can imagine if a male bee is, you know, might be catching these parasites, these little triangulans, 
Um, grooming behavior is pretty important to keep parasites down. So they also groom off pollen, sand dust, whatever. They're very, they're very tidy. Yeah. 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 That's another really, really good question, and that's something I would like to study. Because we always thought before they just made one. And if you thought about it, well, it takes her probably, and I've, I've watched single nests for like 14 days at a time for 17 hours a day <laughs> just to try to see, you know, what, what is she doing? And it takes her about a day and a half to build that tunnel. And then about another half day to construct the cell and provision it and lay an egg. So she's probably doing one nest cell every, every one and a half to two days. And they take breaks. So one female might start a nest, provision a cell, provision a second one, and then she's gone for four days. Just, you know, relaxing, vacationing, I don't know what. But, and then she'll come back and resume nesting, as long as she can find her same nest. Now, if we've been running along on the beach and we step on the nest entrance, she'll try to reopen it and she'll work for at least an entire day trying to dig it out, and then eventually, after one day, she'll give up, and then she'll tr start a new one. So it takes several days. What was your original question? Oh, how many does she make? We don't know. And for that, we'd have to track individual females and mark them. And I've started doing that. There's a little number tag you can glue on their back. But as I said, they're very fastidious groomers, and they have learned how to rip that thing right off. <laughs> um, so another thing that I've done is for short-term marking is, and it sounds really terrible, but it's really kind of cute. Um, I dust them with chalk, a colored chalk. So I'll have bright orange bees out there because I've just dusted them with bright orange line chalk or blue bees. I call those my blueberry bees. I'm my orange bees are my Cheeto bees. And, um, and then I can watch that individual bee fly around and tell it apart from all the others. Because when you, my videos were working, you could see how quickly these things do fly. And it's just, it's just yeah, all over the place. Um, but you'd have to mark individual females, do it for several, you know, during the whole course of her lifetime, see how many nests she established, have a way to mark each of those nests, and to do that, what I do is I put, again, colored chalk, I love colored chalk, I blow it into the nest entrance, and then her scopy that have that, all those hairs, pick up the chalk, just like they pick up pollen grains, carry it down into the nest, and when they do that, they're scraping the edges of the tunnel, they leave a little trail, and I also put um, fluorescence, uh, fluorescent powder in with that. So even if the, the color trail is very faint, I can take a black light, and I can find that trail underneath the sand once it's already been filled in. So I can, and that's the one way I, told, I could tell that each of those cells belonged to that bee because they had that particular color of chalk either in the cell or right outside of the cell door or in the tunnel leading to it. So that's how I, yeah. You know, um, I have seen females try to take over other females' tunnels. You have females that uh, get confused and lose where their tunnel is, and they kind of like keep trying out every other one that's there um, until they finally find their own. Um, and in a similar bee down in Brazil that I was talking about earlier for the show, um, he did find uh, cases where females would usurp another female's nest. After she'd already dug that tunnel, it's like, you know, why do the work myself? I'll just take hers. Um, so you'll see, you'll see females fighting at the nest site. But it's not real common. But I think it does happen. But it's not real common. Anyone else? Other questions? Yeah? Uh, do you know why the nest in Heidi is? Is it just a microclimate? Or? That's a great question, too. <laughs> we don't know all these things. Uh, so you know, one of the hypotheses is that, yeah, that it's the microclimate, that there's something about that particular spot that maybe it's, you know, fungus-free or it's, you know, just the right moisture level or just the right sand texture or something like that. Um, or it could also be that the females will always nest where they emerge from. That's called phylopatry, and it's very common in insects. So she emerges in an area, and, well, if it worked for her, it should work for her offspring, right? So she will nest where she emerged, and I think that's... Um, definitely what's happening, again, you'd have to mark individuals, get her just as soon as she pops out of the ground, trace her for the rest of her life. And uh, what I have seen is um, bees emerging from areas where I've had old nests, and I can tell that because there's colored chalk that they push up as they come out, and then I'll see a new nest hole like directly next to it. 
Now, I don't know it's the same bee because I didn't mark the individual, but it suggests that that's probably what's happening. So as you get more and more generations, the aggregation just gets bigger. For long-term tracking of an individual, I'm sure you've thought of this already, but have you tried a paint pen, like deep plunger and a paint pen for same wing? Yeah, um, again, they're really good groomers. <laughs> so they just rip it right off. The one place they can't reach seems to be right where the abdomen, which is the middle section where all the legs and wings are attached, um, or the thorax attaches the abdomen, which is the butt end. So right in that crease there, um, they tend not to be able to reach too much. But usually what people do when they're marking bees is they put a series of different colored dots in different patterns on the, the curved part of the thorax. Um, many bees have a, a naked thorax. The silver bee has extremely hairy thorax. When she emerges, when she's an old bee, that all that hair has worn off. So not only is she grooming, but as she goes in and out of that nest tunnel with that abrasive sand, she's rubbing all the hair off, which would mean she rubs off whatever paint you have. So you'd have to kind of recatch her periodically and, and touch her up a little bit. But yeah, you could do that. And I know people that have, not with this bee, but other bees. That that is also an excellent question. We would have to have mapped them beforehand to know where they were and where they weren't before we could say yes, they've expanded or no, they haven't. And that's another thing that um, Rachel Olaf, the last grad student I talked about, is trying to do. She's trying to start a citizen science project where people will have a you know quadrat of the dunes that they have to wander over periodically and start mapping where these aggregations are. And then not only where they are, but how large they are, what their timing is. So this is just the beginning of what she's trying to get started to monitor um, different sites. And then you can look at restoration questions. You know, is the type of methods we're using expanding their um, aggregations or limiting them? As far as the range of the bee goes, the distribution of this species goes from Washington State down to Baja, Mexico. So. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, it's just, it's not confined to here, but it is confined, we thought, to coastal dune communities, which, as we all know, are far and few between and are becoming even more far and few between without the efforts of restoration um, like we had at Landfear. But what's also kind of fun and I didn't talk about here is that um, an undergrad found a bee up at um, Elkhead in Trinidad. Well, there are no dune systems up at Elkhead. But these bees do fly like two to 3,000 kilometers. So it's like they can fly a, a pretty good distance. Um, yeah, isn't that amazing? <laughs> no, so sorry, two to three, no wait. Two to 3,000 meters, yes, sorry. Yeah, I was like, wow, they can go like around the world. Um, no, <laughs> I'm terrible with numbers. But yeah, they can fly up to about like, you know, three kilometers. Um, so they could probably, and that's important because they're one of the species that comes out really early, they fly long distances, so they can connect these distant patches of dew mat vegetation and do um, pollination for things like the wallflower that blooms at the dunes and there's not much out except for bumblebees and they also pollinate that. Um, but what we found was, so we found the bee there and um, so I went and looked around and in the sandy bluffs along uh, Elkhead up in Trinidad, there are nesting aggregations of silver bees. And that is an um, ancient perch dune system. So that had been sand dunes back when the ocean was way, way farther away than it is now. Um, and they've been eroded away. But if you look at it, it's, it looks just like a dune that's been <coughs> cut in half. And there are bees nesting there. Uh, those bluffs are quickly eroding. I don't know how deep they go, so I'm not sure how long that aggregation is going to be there. Um, but one of the things I've been trying to look into is, is nest structure the same when you're going into a vertical wall as when you're going down into a horizontal, you know, nesting in a horizontal area. So does that answer your question? <laughs> okay. So they, they have potential to nest in more habitats than we thought. Um, they're also nesting down at the Matol River in an area that used to be a dune system. There's a, a little remains of a dune system down there, but mostly it's a deflation plain where the dune has been blown away and it's now very low and 
and mostly organic matter, and they're nesting there, and it's one of the largest aggregations I've ever seen. So they've adapted to nesting in this totally different situation. So I think that these, you know, they not only nest where they were born, but you know, these aggregations are probably literally hundreds of thousands of years old. I mean, they just, they've um, gone on for a long time. They kind of shift with the shifting sands, but, but they've been going on for a long time. So hopefully they can survive through us and keep going. Anything else? Yeah? The, the male, how, how old is that little male That's a great question, too. And for that, you'd need to mark males um, and find out who is the one that successfully mates and does that male mate again. So um, I've marked males to watch their searching patterns. And what I've noticed is that by using the color chalk, so I don't know individuals, but I can say, okay, I've got 10 marked bees and watch them for a while. And only a few of those marked bees will be at the nest aggregation at any one time. So where else are they going? They're flying around in huge circuits. Are they hitting other aggregations? So is that the way we're getting genetic mixing going on because the females are staying in one place? And also, they're looking for females on flowers, which is something else that we didn't think was happening. But um, I've documented that as well. So um, they're searching out the flowers. They're probably searching at other aggregations. Um, but to find out how successful one male is, you'd have to mark the individual males and then catch the mating balls and see who was. Uh, but probably, and we used to think that females were mated only once. Um, in some cases, the male can actually put a plug in the female so that she can't be mated again. Uh, but I did an experiment in which I resorted to bee bondage, I call it, where I had the female on a tether and <laughs> staked her to the sand. Oh, this is horrible. But she could fly around, but she was still, she was in one place, so she couldn't fly away, but she, the males had access to her. And I found that, and I watched her for an hour and then logged how many times she was mated. Not only that, but I measured a bunch of other behaviors, like how the male approached her and how many were approaching her and um, what the flight pattern was. And um, she can be mated multiple times. It's, it's not limited to once. So she got mated when she emerges. And then what if she's out foraging on a flower? Well, then another male might mate her. And some males can actually wash out the sperm of the first male that mated with her with the second one. So you Without doing genetic studies, you won't really know who was successful. You can say who made it with her, but who was the last one, and you know where did the offspring come from? And yeah, but these are all wonderful, wonderful questions, and that's that's what's so exciting about research. Is one thing leads you to the next one, next one, next one. Anyone else? Well, thank you again so much for coming on this absolutely gorgeous day, and uh, I wish I'd given you the long version. I would have been able to show you pictures of all these things that I'm talking about now, but. Um, but thank you. You're free to go. <laughs>